is from where I am from. Um, my uh, speciality is actually spectroscopy. So I worked on a lot of spectroscopy and on a lot of different electronic devices you know, for a long time. Uh, but at some point, um, I was getting curious what we can use these devices for, part of doing things like uh, RF amplifying, uh, emitting light, and etc. So on my sort of research here I started shifting more towards kind of using electronic devices for sensing and sort of I start to kind of get involved with in the uh, biochemical sensing area so I'm then trying to kind of marry some of the light investigation techniques with biochemical sensing and devices so uh, and one of my interests is plasmonic so I'll come back to what it is actually later so um, I did my master's in Ukraine, so in 98, a long time ago, so and then I did my PhD in Germany, and then I moved to uh, Bristol, where I did two postdocs, um, working primarily on spectroscopy again, and since about 2008, uh, I got a fellowship and lectureship in, in uh, there. So, uh, University of Bristol, so if you can see that m little map there, so this is UK, uh, Bristol is actually here, so it's on the other side of London, so it's on the west coast, uh, in the southwest. Uh, the University of Bristol is a relatively large institution, so we have about 18,000 undergraduate students and about 6,000 postgraduate students. And you already probably heard talk on Saturday from Anala, who is my colleague working in Bristol. She was talking about uh, drug delivery and yeah, biophysics. Yeah. Yeah, that's very good. So, um, so Anna is my colleague. So, um, we have actually a third person who is uh, involved within this nanomet uh, twin project. So, uh, Massimo uh, Antognozzi, he is working on high-speed and unusual types of uh, nanoprop microscopy. So, unfortunately, he couldn't make uh, this presentation. So, you have to only me to endure now. So, and then Professor Mimura, of course. He's at the back there, so he'll be next in line, he'll be your final <laughs> tormentor today. So, um, so I work in a school of physics, a uh, school of physics made a, a lot of different departments uh, or small institutions, so we have people who work on very high energy and astrophysics down to nanoscience, so I work in materials and devices group in there. So, um, today, so I'll be giving you some lecture uh, which uh, requires you some basic understanding about uh, solid state physics and electrodynamics. So I'll, I'll talk briefly about this. But unfortunately, for those who are not coming from physics background, some of it might seem strange. Just don't listen that bit. Um, there might be some pictures later on where you might see more relevance. So, um, so what I intend to give you today is try to. Uh, give you some idea of what actually the background, what are the plasmons, so physically, and how we can describe them, and so how we can link this uh, particular type of species, like plasmon, to light matter interactions. So how we can uh, improve or modify how the light interacts with matter using this plasmon. So I'll give you a general overview about motivation behind such field of plasmodics, and then we'll go through a series of different topics and examples, some of them related to what I do, some of them are taken from the literature. So you give a kind of broad overview why I want to talk about this to you. Okay, so, um, so literature could be helpful for this topic, it covers actually a lot of disciplines, so um, there are some mentioned there what I did as well, so you don't have any handouts from my lecture. So in order to save you some um, printing stuff, and you know, it goes to waste generally, so much paper, um, what are you going to do? You're going to listen to this talk, and then later on, uh, Irina is going to send you a link to OneDrive folder, where you have all the slides and copies of the papers, which I cite in this talk, so you can just open them and read at your own leisure rather than trying to scribble something on the paper. So it's, I prefer in that way. So um, unfortunately, you have to kind of look at me and kind of listen to what I say. So there will be no slides for you ready. You know. But it will be easier for you later on. So I'll try um, 
to be helpful as much as I can. So there are some selected papers on plasmonic, generally an overview, in particular a few of them are talking about kind of road maps so of where the plasmonics is, what areas it's used for, and what are the current papers in that area. So there's a whole journal called Journal uh, of Plasmonics. Uh, there are many, obviously, papers on plasmonic published in a lot of different disciplines, from biological papers to uh, quantum physics. So, uh, but this journal is kind of covers quite a lot of this discipline, so uh, you can access it there. And I mentioned here, this is a link to OneDrive folder. Okay, so what is the motivation behind this? So, uh, Generally, so uh, you might be heard about things like optics and photonics is generally light, electromagnetic waves, and you can find a lot of examples where technology we use nowadays using light or electromagnetic waves. You have radio waves for communication, yeah. so we have infrared waves for sensing heat, for instance. We have visible waves to do a lot of things. We look at the world using visible light. Yeah, so. Then we use a lot of display and projection technology, so making images, which we can see, a lot, use a lot of visible light, so we have a lot of technology which support these applications. There is also application going down to ultraviolet, so where we can actually start to look at the, or shorter wavelengths, start to look at these species which are we mostly interested in when we do things, like biochemical sensing or cellular imaging, we want to look at things which are small. Unfortunately, as you can see, visible light is generally far too big to look at the small things, as you probably know from some of your courses. So the wavelengths of the visible light is about 500 nanometers, uh, or half a micron, uh, where the molecules have an order or two orders of magnitude smaller than that. So generally, a lot of optical spectroscopy, at least directly, cannot be used to image very intricate details of the cell, uh, let alone individual atoms, so we're not even talking about a single nanometer or angstrom scale. So, and generally all the conventional technology of photonics, things which are used to manipulate light, so photonics is generally broadly uh, an area which is used to kind of manipulate light, so, uh, so photons is the particles of light, uh, if you might say, so it's not working because there's a diffraction limit, so saying generally that anything smaller than wavelengths of the light or the probing sort of beam you're using cannot be them, nothing can be resolved beyond that. And the plasmonic comes here that actually by utilizing this you're able to control the light at a much smaller scale. So and this is where the whole field started. So by using plasmon you're actually able to take the visible light and transform it into some other light, which is then manipulates at much smaller nanoscale dimensions. And this allows you the whole range of potentially revolutionary phenomena. So, um, so but before we go into overview of this, let's think about it, what actually plasmon is. So finally I arrived at that point. So a plasmon is a coherent, that means it oscillates at the same frequency, uh, and in the same phase, that means Everything oscillates together, so not randomly. One goes in one way, and one goes another way. So oscillations of free electrons gas. So electrons is a charged particles which sits inside the matter. So um, and here it's already a, a caveat because it says a free electron gas. Free electron gas means these particles are not bound to atoms, or at least they can travel between them and contribute to conductivity. So it is so-called quasi-particle. So um, quasi-particle refer generally to the big class of particles which doesn't have some sort of material equivalent. So like things, atoms made of material particles, protons, neutrons, or electrons itself is a material particle. There's a matter, piece of matter associated with that. There are other particles which do not have a piece of matter associated with this, and they are called quasi-particles. Uh, there are other examples of it. Uh, for instance, phonon is oscillations of atoms inside the material also can describe as a particle, especially in crystals, yeah. And again, it, this particle doesn't have a material cooling. It just exists as a collective motion of some uh, species. In this case, either electrons or atoms, for instance. 
So this is not unique quasi-particle, but it is interesting quasi-particle. And actually, history of plasmonic starts a very, very long time ago. So even uh, old Romans used plasmonics uh, without realizing it, of course. So they had no idea why things were like this. But what they did, they were creating this special glass. And this special glass has very peculiar properties because if you look at it in reflected light, it was looking green, like the one on the back. And if you put a light behind it, it was looking red. So this is not very easy to understand. So the, it was kind of mimicking some of the unusual properties of maybe um, uh, some rubies or something like this. So, but co compared to rubies, it has very you know, distinct sort of colors when you look at it in one way or another. So uh, it was not just a gemstone. It had some sort of this magic kind of property. So they didn't know why it was happening. And, you know, for a long time, people were using these things um, without actually knowing what was going on until about 19th century when uh, a German physicist, Gustav Me, was working on the theory of scattering. So, and, and then he started to look at the optical properties of things where the wavelengths of light were largely equal to the dimensions of the materials. So then there were other physicists working on, for instance, uh, uh, Fuchs, who was working on modes of electrons in sort of cubic uh, uh, pieces of metal. So, um, and since then, the kind of uh, field of plasmonics, so people start to understand that there's actually materials made of different things. There's electrons there, there's atoms there, the conductivity is uh, sort of happening due to charged particles and so on. So electrodynamics start developing, even quantum physics. So then the whole field start develop with that as well. So, um, so and I mentioned to you, so the plasmons is oscillations of plasma. So in the first material you know which has a free electron, so conducted well, is metal. Yeah. So let's remind ourselves what metals are. Metals are a group of Elements like this, for instance, silver, gold, iron, etc., copper. Uh, typically, these uh, materials have some very well defined crystal lattices. They typically crystallize in some type, kind of cubic lattices. So, atom arrangement is cubic or sometimes hexagonal close packing. Um, what is important in terms of physics is that uh, the binding between atoms is non directional, and that means that what we call the wave function, so from these uh, particles spread over quite a lot of different atoms. So, and electrons which exist in them can be actually smeared out across lots of different atoms. And it's due to the fact that when we put them together from single atoms, start closing them together, this diagram shows instead of single levels, like, you know, maybe in hydrogen atoms here, there's very defined orbitals like S, P, and so on, yeah, so d orbitals and so on. Um, these orbitals start to smear out. It's because of uh, a guy called Pauli. He said electrons doesn't really like to be in the same positions. So and when you move them closer, they just push each other away and rearrange themselves in bands. So they don't sit on the same energy levels. So, <clears throat> and these bands start to mix in a peculiar way. So we have a whole field called quantum physics which can explain how does the properties of matter actually form when you start moving particles together? So you really need to use quantum physics. But what I generally want to say that after that, the result is some of the electrons become unpaired. They kind of spare. So, and these electrons can move around like a sea of liquid yeah, between the atoms. They're not really free particles. You remember, I said, oh, it's a free electron gas. Actually, there was a, quite a big problem for physicists uh, for some in the beginning of 20th century. So how do we actually describe these electrons? Because we know how to work with plasma, which was kind of electrons flying around in vacuum, let's say. They're not flying in vacuum, but soon the model of quantum formalism was discovered. And this is not a problem nowadays. Um, so, but to a large extent, we can describe properties of metals as some sort of a core. So this is the atoms bound to each other and electrons which are still sit kind of in the valence orbitals, somewhat below here, yeah, and tightly bound to the atoms, and electrons which move around. 
and they're free. So, and this is kind of two parts which make properties of metals. This is a very crude approximation, but it will work for the beginning. So, how about then go through the optical properties from there? So, we will need to start with Maxwell equations, and I'm afraid there will be a couple equations in this talk, uh, because as a physicist I can't avoid them, but don't worry about it, so you don't need to memorize them, but they just used to illustrate a few things. Um, and then I arrive at the properties of matter, and how these properties of matter are responsible for the light-matter interaction, and one of the things which can directly affect these uh, properties is the optical spectrum. Or you can use it in vice versa. Optical spectrum, things like when we shine light on the materials, like can see what reflected, transmitted, absorbed, or get lost, uh, can be used to characterize these optical properties. Yeah, so this is the way of us of studying what is actually going on. Yeah, shining light on these species and see what comes back, or not coming back. So, uh, Maxwell equation ge generally describes it that uh, there is some electric and magnetic field, so electromagnetic wave can be incident on the material, and then the response, I don't know if you can see, do you see this? So this is the response of the material to the external electric field, which is this one, and this is the response of the material to the external magnetic field, which is that one here, so, and this is the equation which describes it. Somewhere in the middle, between this electric field and the response, is this bit here. And this bit here is called dielectric function. Basically, it, a material property. This is what gives material... Uh, oh, this is what will tell us whether the material will reflect, absorb, or whatever, do things with the light. Uh, an important bit about material property that a part of just going into material so this light can do something else to this material, can interact with it, and in certain materials it can actually move the charges around. So it can push the charges to go one way or another, similar to like if you have a, a capacitor, you apply electric field, so the electrons will go one way, and lack of electrons will go the another way, so you have positive and negative charge. So generally materials will be neutral, but by applying electric field, you can actually move the charges one way and another way and create some sort of capacitance or electric field in there. And this effect called polarization. So light acting on the material can actually polarize it. And this is the most interesting bit of it uh, for us because this is what will tell us uh, a lot about optical properties. So then... Um, in order to wave to propagate, you need to solve what's called wave equation in physics, and it's not important. The important bit is, is that if you look at solutions, it will tell us that to wave, in order to wave to propagate, there are two quantities which need to be uh, positive. So basically, this bit here needs to be positive. So this is dielectric properties of material and magnetic properties of material times together, they need to be positive. Otherwise, the weight does not go in the material. So what that brings us to this some sort of this funny diagram, so where you have magnetic properties of material one way and dielectric or electric properties of material another way. Generally, for when we're talking about light, we'll kind of forget about magnetic field much. So for magnetic field, we can roughly approximate that magnetic property is unity, just one. So and we'll look at the, what's happened to electric field. And you can quickly, if you draw a line through one on that scale here, you will realize there's two things which you can have. One of them where is mu and epsilon are positive, and this is good. And we have propagating wave, it's everything which is transparent to light. So we'll have properties like this. Then you'll have things which are called dampened solution, where, where there is no solution, solution in fact is imaginary, yeah? so something square equal negative number, it's not very good, yeah? so um, as you remember from some of your math courses, so and generally metals falls into this category, so metals, we said mu is equal 1, so it's a positive, actually metals for most of the part, the electric, pro the electric property will be negative. So I'm going to remember that. There's actually another bit here where positive solutions are possible. And this is a very curious uh, part of the matter. Uh, 
which is both magnetic and electronic properties are negative for these particular conditions or for the light or that frequency. And this area here is what represented by so-called metamaterials. Uh, in that folder, there is a, a special presentation about metamaterials, so I will not talk about metamaterials. They are hugely interested. I can start, start here and talk for a whole day about different metamaterials. They allow you to do what is called um, negative index of refraction, where the light actually goes through material to, in a very peculiar way, and you can actually focus beyond the diffraction limit. So we will skip that. So what we need to note that actually when we look at the movements of electrons, uh, they are not actually that free. When they move through the material, they will have experienced drag. So they will be getting stuck on something, and they will not actually oscillate that well. After some point, they will kind of die out. So, um, and what we need to do, we actually need to introduce some other things. So when the materials are oscillating, uh, they will oscillate with particular frequency, but there will always be something which connects to dumping. So and this is this term gamma here. So, um, and this is the motion of electron with time, and this is kind of it, what the electric wave, electromagnetic wave is. So um, what it gives us, um, we'll arrive to this so-called Drude model, so where the all electrons um, can move in the material, and generally the frequency of those electrons can be described. Ooh, you, I don't think you see here. Uh, I by mistake blocked the important bit here. So the dielectric properties. This is how the metal responds to light depends on this bit here, and it has p there, and p is there is for plasmon. A plasmon there uh, is actually depends on how many electrons are there, and what this you can't see there is a mass of an electron in the matter, but generally it does give us something. So what we can able to tell us, okay, metals actually for most of the part has a negative dielectric function. So you can look at this through the model and then measure it experimentally and you can see actually it doesn't fit. The reason for this is when I told you that electrons motion is completely independent of what core electrons do it's not true, that they actually mix apart and you need to mix them together properly to obtain this experimental data, but we can do that. But generally, if you look at these lines, they're not even that interesting. This is, we can calculate the reflectivity spectra and you know that most of the metals are just shiny. Yeah, and what can you do with light and metal? You can make mirror. And that's about it, you know. Well, I can reflect the light, make some, uh, burn some ships, yeah as Aristotle proposed it, but it's not that interesting, it's actually boring. So metals are, for first, you know, look optically boring. Actually, there's another interesting point. You know, all metals are look sort of silverish, yeah? There are a few metals which look yellow. One of them is gold, another one is what? Platinum. Platinum is not, uh, pure platinum is not that gold. Copper, for instance, gold. yeah? Copper and gold, and they're yellow. It is funny because you can see it depend, doesn't matter what kind of atoms are really in the first instance, all metals will be look reflected. But the gold and copper, they're peculiar. You can go actually Google why the gold is yellow. It's a very interesting problem. problem. People still don't actually agree why, what this exactly is. There is a two different mechanisms proposed for this, but in reality it's probably a mixture of them both explaining why the gold is yellow, so we skip that for a moment, so it's not interesting. What is becoming interesting, so when you start to make nanoparticles, it completely changes the story. It completely changes the story in two different ways. First of all, a part of this swishing of electrons in the material, you have a small structure now, instead of a big material, so that swishing now happens on a very small scale. So as you can see, if I put a particle here in an uh, electric field, and the electric field is oscillating because it's electromagnetic wave, and it oscillates really quick. So it's a terahertz, 10 to the 15 sometimes even, so per second, uh, lots of times. So you can see that electrons will move one way, and this part of metal will become depleted of electrons, and both positive and negative. So what you can see, you form a sort of a dipole there, 
and it gives you what's it called localized surface plasma mode. So, and, and for most time, I will be talking about modes like this. So when you have a nanostructure, you put it in an electric field like light, and it takes this light. It works similar to antenna, but what antenna does, it just mimics the oscillations of electromagnetic field. The plasmonic antenna transforms oscillations from light into another type of light, which is now localized surface plasma. And what is interesting about this, that this light is now condensed to a much smaller scale. So this big thing is drawn here just for uh, clarity. You can have very small particles. So, and the light in these particles or plasmon will exist on the scale of nanometers. Uh, there is another actually species of a plasmon, and this is a plasmon which travels along a surface. So, uh, and it's called localized or surface plasmon polariton. There's many other applications of this surface traveling plasmon. It also localizes it, but not in 3D, but to a, a, a surface in this case. And in this case, it's when the electromagnetic travels along that wave, you get positive, negative, positive, negative distribution. So you got a field like this, and it propagates. So while this one is localized. So, um, and that changes everything, as I said now, because when you shine the light on these materials, instead of being gray and boring, they become colorful and interesting. <laughs> yeah, so this is an example of kind of different colors produced by different sizes of plasmonic structures. So what you can see that this is our usual kind of absorption. Yeah, so the metals will absorb somewhere here due to this inter transition, as I said before. But now, instead of this boring spectrum, as I've shown before here, for instance, this is gold particle, you will have this a strong band somewhere in the red at 550 or sort of, uh, nanometers, so between green and red wavelengths, actually. Yeah. So, um, and the how well this band, or how this well this plasma oscillate, and actually described by another thing which is called quality factor. It's a funny term to describe basically how long things will oscillate. So if the quality factor is high, you make it ping like a cameraton and it will resonate forever. It will go over one frequency a lot of time. If the quality factor is back, you pin it and do that. So the same happens to plasmons. So and it's important how well the structure is made or designed and because if you look at the enhancement it's the ratio between electric field in that plasmon and the ratio of electric field what was initially an in electromagnetic wave is directly proportional to that quality factor so it's not just a, a frequency what color it makes it's also how well it resonates is important and you can see that the enhancement of the field here is about 10,000 times. So, and that can be used for a lot of different things. So, and generally this plasmonic can affect a lot of different applications. So you can have bioimaging, chemical sensing, lab on the chip devices, and I'll try to talk through them now. So I've got about a another 25 minutes hopefully um, so first of all we look now at the color so what is the color depends on so where this band is and the color depends on many different things one of them is the size of the particle size of the particle introduces generally another term into the damping uh, story and you add this bit to the equation there. So, and what you can do, you can change the size of silver nanoparticles, and this is what we call spectra. So this is not a very good way to represent things for non physicists. So, I apologize for, for things. I'll be talking a lot of spectra here. And spectra is something like intensity of light versus particular color. So, where the colors are. So, 400 
on a lot of the scales, 400 is where we start stop seeing light. So it's very deep blue, ultraviolet. Um, 750, this is very, very red, very dim red. So around 550 is sort of green, orange part. So you can actually make the color change in the particles by changing its size. Then also particles can have different shape. You can have a ball, a spherical particle, you can have a cubic particle, you can have very funny shaped particle and that will change amount of peaks you will have in there. So you can actually produce slightly very complex mixture by changing the shape but you also can put this metal particle somewhere else inside water, inside cell and it will also change its color because the electric surrounding of the particle will change and that means that oscillations will happen at different strengths so the color of the particle will change in the you shine the light and what is reflecting will change depending on what's around it and you're already getting the idea where is it going so, yeah. so there's a good article called Rod Martin Plasmonics. I'll put that on the folder so you can read that about. So there's a lot of different applications of plasmonic and broadly they can be split in optics, things to do with light and anything else. So um, I actually have examples of all of it but in view of time we'll probably go quicker through some of them and stop more in some of that. So there's a lot of spectroscopy and imaging to do with trying to image individual molecules or individual cells and etc. Um, some even novel physics like a quantum plasmonic lasers and so on, so I will not touch on them, I promise that. The non-optical things, things like uh, when we shine the light on these particles I told you that they will reflect. But you've seen there was a, another thing about damping. So that mean, damping term generally means when you shine the light on them, some light will be reflected, but some of it will go somewhere else. The energy will be lost. And generally this lost energy will go, like in any mechanical system, will go into heat. You can actually selectively heat particles yeah, by shining light on them, uh, or different color light. So you can design a particle which will heat in the red light, design a particle which will heat more in the green light. <coughs> and this allows you to some things which we call teranostics. This is combining the diagnostics with treatment. So and I'll give you some examples of it in the talk. So things like photocatalysis. So you can in, in accelerate some reactions using plasmons. So very locally you can make reaction happen just around the nanoparticle for instance or make things like drug release, targeted drug release for instance using plasmonic particles and other things which are probably less interesting to you in terms of biomedical applications. So, um, so what I'm going to talk about how to first make the particles. So this is where we introduce, there's lots of different methods, so there's another uh, whole review article on how to make nanoparticles, in particular plasmonic nanoparticles or metal. Uh, you can make them just put things in the solution and let atoms stick together and just make them work into clusters and grow bigger and bigger and bigger um, and a lot of people do this because it's very cheap, it's very easy and you, know, you can make lots of it then there's a sort of more targeted weapon, um, methods like you can throw atoms at the surface and let stick it to it and it's things called like chemical or physical deposition so, um, and it's sputtering evaporation and etc so, the another important method is where you can actually put things where you want to. And this is to do with templating. So, how to create a template where you can actually grow or make another particle of particular size in a particular location. It's actually not that easy, especially if you want to do it on a very large scale. Yeah. Okay, so one of the ways uh, we work with another fabrication is to use uh, lithography. A lithography can be, it's a way to create a mask, essentially, or pattern in the, uh, a special material called resist, something which res, uh, responds to that uh, exciting beam, 
beam of excitation, it will change its properties. And there's different types of lithography. You can use the light, uh, it's really large wavelengths. Um, it limits to what structure you can make. You can make, use some sort of very, very short wavelengths light. And this is how modern transistors are made. For instance, things in the CPUs in modern architectures uh, can be as small as 10 nanometers or even smaller just by use of very, very short wavelength light, so extreme U ultraviolet or soft X-rays even, or E-beams, so this is where they use electron beam, which allows you to actually create not actually that smaller structure, surprisingly. Um, so, and the way it works is that you expose a bit of material, uh, then it changes its properties, you etch it, you remove the bit here, then you etch it again into something which is more harder than the resist. Resist is usually a very soft polymer, so it's not very actually good to handle, you can easily scratch it, damage it, so you need to transfer this mask into some sort of a harder material, so it's usually some sort of a nitride, then you can make a hole into it, and then you can deposit things through the hole, and actually on top as well, and then you can remove everything, and then your uh, metal nanoparticle re remains there. So this is one of the kind of traditional way to make lithography in industry as well. So, and it's sort of compatible with a lot of mass way of fabrication. So, how do you actually move to the large area? And this is important because um, you might be able to create sort of individual nanoparticles here and there, or you can make a very tiny area where you arrange them. And it's all very good if you work in the lab. But once you go on the things like what start with big cells or big organs of having like two, three nanoparticles doesn't really help much. You need to make them in big quantities or, or make some electronic devices with them is even more difficult. So one of the ways to make it in a large game is, is to do self-assembly. So to put them in on the surface and let them work together and assemble in some sort of way. And there are many different ways to do this again. Um, one of the interesting ways is to use biological or some organic molecules, let's say, to do this templating. And what organic molecules allow you, once you stick these organic molecules to the gold, for instance, and one of the most common molecules used are actually tiles, I would say. So these tiles can interact then with another nanoparticle and another nanoparticle, and etc. So you can form actually quite complex structures. So if you go to, on this article, we'll give a short overview of all the possible methods. Um, and this is good because you can actually not only control the particles, but you can control the distance between them using these linking molecules. You can use something else, you can use DNA and other things. Um, so, and one way we use um, the assembly is to actually not to do things on the surface, but try to make things in three dimensions. So to grow some metal nanoparticles, but which are assembled in 3D. And one way we did this is to use proteins. Proteins, things like ferritin, are able to crystallize. And it's very important property in the chemistry of and a lot of, actually, biological function is controlled by protein crystallization. Um, this is not that important. I'm not going to talk about physiology here. I'm going to talk about physics. So we can use these proteins to crystallize. And the proteins generally can, like ferritin, has a, a shell with a space inside it. So you can put a particle in there. Yeah, and usually protein... Uh, carries, uh, like ferritin, well, use uh, ferritin inside there. Yeah, so it's a metal uh, iron oxide uh, nanoparticle. You can assemble it. So this is uh, upper ferritin. So this is nothing inside there. So it's a, just empty shell. It's very transparent. So it's just basically a stack of shells here. This is the protein crystal with the uh, ferritin inside there. And this is another protein crystal with the uh, specially made nanoparticles which we put in there. So, and the protein crystal looks like this. It just assembles things in this uh, hexagonal lattice like this in three dimensions. So, uh, and in this case, it's not just uh, interesting electrically. These particles are also magnetic. So it brings some interesting properties which I'm not going to talk about. Now, so another way is to use uh, lithography, as I said before. And um, I told you, because usually light is not very good to create um, 
structures on that scale. And as you can see from previous slide, we nearly need to work with particles which are an order of maybe tens of nanometers. This is far beyond the, uh, um, what is possible normally using cheap optical lithography at least. So we use different methods. One of them is nano-imprinting. Nano-imprinting uh, is a way of creating a stamp and printing it across the different surfaces or you can actually roll it across the large sheets and in this way you can create sort of template uh, uh, around maybe centimeter or maybe sometimes even meter square areas. So and again it's you have a, a master with the holes, you you fill it with the, some something soft, then you cure it, then you lift it up and it have an imprint of this master and then it stamps it uh, across the surface. Yeah. And then you lift it off and you can do things like this. You can see that some very small nano dots printed on the surface. You can arrange them in a different geometry and it's all very good. Uh, but it's um, relatively limited method because you limit it to something which is very rigid. Another way is to create a, a flexible mask. And as I say, we can still use the light. And what we do in Bristol, we employ a slightly different method, which is called Talbot lithography. And it's very, not actually many people are aware of this lithography, so I'm going to talk about it a bit more. Um, so if you shine the light through uh, a particular mask, which is have dimensions close to the wavelengths, you create a diffraction pattern here. So what these red dots represent is where the light is condensed at most, and the blue parts where, the, where there's very little light. So, uh, and this diffraction pattern is still on the order of wavelength. Uh, however, if you look at the diffraction pattern in the depth, so this is, you can see that these holes are now repeat not with the wavelengths distance, but with the half of the wavelengths. So and this is called period, Talbot period. So you can then translate this mask in the depth, and then you can make holes and no holes at slightly smaller dimensions. I'd say at 300 nanometers, so the half of the wavelengths of light. So and you can buy a commercial instrument which does this. So and you can... What you can do, you can actually produce different types of patterns. You can make lines, you can have holes, you can make holes around it in a different way. And this is what we want when we work with nanoparticles. We just not want them somewhere. We want them to arrange in a particular way. You can make even more complicated patterns by using very interesting maths like this. So, um, and you can control the feature size. So you can go down to relatively small dimensions using the same wavelength. So we don't change the wavelength. We just change the mask. So control the period. So there's some examples. So you can make um, either holes or you can make isolated structures, depending what type of resistor you're using. You can say, OK, I want a hole to be remaining there, or I want everything to go, but instead of have a pillar there. Uh, by the way, if you have any questions, you can. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, have you tried the uh, holography? Interferometry for printing uh, patterns? Interferometry is again, it's limited by diffraction. Plus, you have very rigid mask for interferometry. I'll show you. Um, you can have things like 2 pi, 4 pi microscopy where you interfere many different beams. You can shrink the duration uh, due to some nonlinear effects as well. So, and this is used in some fluorescent techniques as well. So, uh, where instead of where you interfere with light, you can actually squeeze the light a bit tighter than the wavelength. But it's a very... These interferometry techniques are very tricky to use because it generally requires... Uh, um, you need to work with the transparent substrates or they're very sensitive to the, how flat the surface is, and etc. Well, this technique actually allows you to have very curved surface because we translate it vertically so you can have samples which are tilting and not very flat, so for instance. So, and you can do it in things like this. You can grow a lot of nanorods, for instance, or nanoparticles over the large area because it's exposing things at once. 
So you don't have to actually make a hole at the time then move to another space and make a hole like you do in e-beam lithography, for instance. And you can do it on a small scale, maybe 100 microns. But do it on one millimeter will take you a day. So doing across the wafer, doing it hole by hole will take you forever. And this way you can do exposure just within a few seconds and then develop it and within an hour you have a whole, a big wafer passionate in nanoparticles with the same dimension, with the same spacing. Um, what we actually developed here as well is that you can have the mask of holes and then you can translate the sample underneath it and allow you to write the structures with that hole and we call it double displacement, double lithography. so you combine this with the, some nano positioning stage and you can make very funny structures out of this you can make actually holes which are spaced very closely and this is what we want for many uh, um, applications because holes we make in this net are still relatively large so they're still hundreds of nanometers instead of tens of nanometers but we can make holes which are separated by tens or maybe 30, 50 nanometers and that becomes interesting for plasmonics or you can make more complex structures which look like this and so on so um, Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is what these, these metal nanoparticles or holes or uh, apertures can be used for so, um, generally, what is good about biomedical applications because nanoparticles are on the scale of a lot of things we're interested in. So, they are on the scale of nanometers at least, and to a large extent, a lot of them can be made biocompatible. They, to some extent, do not interact with the cells or biomaterial around it. Of course, it depends on concentration. You can kill everything by, for instance, even with silver yeah, or gold if you put a lot of it in the cell, but generally they are relatively inert, yeah, at least noble metals. Yeah. So, and allow us to do a lot of in vitro investigations where we can look actually what's going on in life way. <coughs> so, uh, so, and the first important area is the imaging. So how we can image small things, even like say individual parts of the cell, membranes, how we can distinguish between what's going on the membrane, inside the membrane or behind it, and so on. So uh, there are different methods to do this. One of them is just to stick things to nanoparticles and they just shine light through it in the solution. So you can still get the signal around it. And when things are touched or detached from nanoparticles, you will see the change. This way you, are, uh, you can get some information, but you don't do imaging. So to do imaging, people use a variety of different spectroscopy, and one of the ways when you shine the light through what is called plasmonic waveguide, that means the light is at some way stops propagating normally as a light and start propagating as a plasmon. That means it starts to get focused to a much smaller dimension. So it couples from normal light into the plasmon. So here there is a a probe which is coated, for instance, with the gold, you shine a light inside it, it's like a fiber, optical fiber, but generally the light will bounce back at some point because the light cannot squeeze through the fiber anymore because it will make very small. But you can squeeze the light further by coupling this thing into a plasmon. So there are different versions of it. Um, um, you can have some techniques which allow you to do this. You can look at the what's called Raman scattering, which allows you to uh, get the molecular fingerprint of what was going on, not just say, okay, this particle there, it can actually tell you what is actually caught in that and what type of bonds they are, what is, whether it's a CH bond or NH bond or some sort of carbon-carbon bond, you can tell about whether it's a double helix or beta uh, helix and so on, so it's a very good way because a lot of imaging just give you colorful pictures but it doesn't tell you what species they are unless you label it. Yeah? So there's a lot of interest into the applications where you can actually image things without labeling. And labeling is good to extend, but it comes with the penalties, as you know. Uh, or do things like we call photonics chips, where you can squeeze the light through a very small dimensions, you can couple it to the plasma, do something else, it cap it to the normal waveguide, and so on. So you can read more about it in this uh, paper there. So this is just an example of this uh, surface enhanced Raman scattering. So if you have a, a tip uh, of metal or fiber uh, sitting on the substrate or sometimes this 
uh, a metal nanoparticle can be placed on the surface here. Yeah, you can attach the molecules to it and you can image what the molecules is. That is good. Some sort of nanoscale dimension. So this is two nanometers. So this is like STM prop or uh, scanning tunnel microscope, for instance, prop type. So it can give you quite good atomic resolution. But STM just didn't tell you. It says there's a bump, but it doesn't tell you what bump is actually or made of. Uh, but shining light in here allows you to prop what is actually this bump is made of, and you can detect the molecules around it. And this uh, allows you to detect in the single molecules. Um, using this technique. And this is all down to reshaping of electric field from light, big wavelengths, to a very tiny wavelength. And this tiny wavelength is amplifying the later ma uh, ma matter light interactions. So um, you can actually tell which way the molecule is oriented now. So because it's good to say, okay, there is a, a, some uh, alkane molecule sticking this way, but it could also be laying down on the surface. So sometimes when you want to do some functionalization or stick things together, you can have very different results. You can actually see, oh, molecules are there, but because they're not oriented properly, they're lying down like this, or they're cross-linked, for instance, nothing is happening. So it's good to tell whether the molecules are actually oriented this way, and you can do this using this spectroscopy, because when the molecule is tilted, the response will be different. So you can see a different bond, or the frequency will change, and so on. Uh, or you can do some very smart sensors. So, and this is examples of the plasmonic sensor. In this case, we don't use the metal here. So, or these people here in this article don't use the metal. They use a very fancy metal called graphene. So, uh, this fancy metal is generally uh, metals are conductive. But if you make them very, very small, there's no way for the electrons to sit in them. They stop conducting. So, and plasmon disappears. Um, a graphene is the fancy metal which is made out of the single sheet of carbon atoms, so it's still conductive due to very funny quantum mechanical phenomena, I'll not touch on this, but it allows you to have its own plasmon in a very confined area. So, and the more confined your plasmon, the better the resolution is, but also the more enhancement you get. Yeah. So you can actually, again, very good information about molecules so, and this is different strips of the graphene, uh, and there is a bit of light shining on it. And also you can do a sensing, so you can use this graphene as an electrode. So, uh, when something is happening, you can have an electrical pulse, which is then translated into modulation of conductivity in the graphene. So, I mean, you can pick up some individual reactions in the molecule, if you're really clever, as I described in this paper. So another thing is, is the fluorescence. So a lot of biological detection based on fluorescence. Yeah, so you have fluorescent tagging, you add some GFP, so green fluorescent proteins, yellow fluorescent proteins, red fluorescent proteins, and that's very good. So um, however, it would be nice if you can do this without tagging. I mean, it, uh, what another part is allow you to do is to change the way the fluorescence is generated. General fluorescence is you excite electrons, it goes into some excited state, then interacts with the atomic uh, arrangements and then collapses down and then re-emits the light. A frequency close to what you have, roughly. Or you can localize this electron somewhere else and then you get this green emission in fluorophores and so on, red emission and so on. But it's a relatively slow process on the uh, reaction time scales. So what you can do, by using metal nanoparticle, you can change how much electric field the uh, this protein or the general material sees. By squeezing this electromagnetic radiation to a tiny space, you actually increase the density of electric field there. And you can have so-called Purcell effect. The Purcell effect has to do with the fact that there is certain time constant associated with cycling electron. Excitation emitting light, excitation emitting light and we call it in lifetime. So, and for many things, this lifetime is fixed to some uh, intensity of the electromagnetic radiation. However, if you can increase it to very high levels, like you can do with plasmons, you can make this go very quick. 
So you can cycle electrons much faster, and that decreases the lifetime but increases the intensity. So you can make things really, really bright. Because if you have just one fluorophore, it does not emit a lot of photons. You can have a big tax, of course, and there's lots of fluorophores, but we are, remember, we are interested in the small molecules that has very localized fluorophore, maybe on order of few, and then you don't have a lot of light. Yeah? And you cannot shine a lot of light on these materials because there's only that many electrons there. They can cycle, but there's no more electrons just because of its matter is limited. Yeah. So and this is uh, the way of the enhancing fluorescence. In this case, there's two pieces of metal. And instead of looking at plasmons on that pieces of metal, we can actually combine them together. And what you see now, so this is the graphical representation of electric field in the plasmon, instead of uh, the wavelengths of light here is an order of from here till about that door maybe. Um, so now you can see electric field in the plasmon is condensed to a much shorter scale and, and in fact it sits in between these two and it generally there will be electric field of each of the corners here and by bringing them together you amplify this effect. So, and it gives you even higher enhancement. So in this way you can detect signal molecules. So this is a individual antennas here with just a few of the molecules like this sticking here in that gap here. And you can get signals from these molecules. And what you see here is what I told you before. This long time here is the normal fluorescence. And this curve here is the fluorescence when you have an antenna there. So you see the lifetime is much shorter than in normal case, so it increases the intensity. You see these red bits here, this is how stronger the effect gets compared to no antennas here. Yeah. Okay, so um, what I work here in particular, it's the UV plasmonics. Because a lot of materials I talked before, like gold, which is very popular for use of plasmonics, has limited to its natural plasma frequency to about 500 something nanometers. Uh, so that means it can work with green light and so on, but not other things. It's but near infrared typically use it for gold plasmonics. Um, and as you know, a lot of biological stuff fluoresce in UV. Yeah. So having plasmons operating in this frequency or have antennas which work for UV light would be really good. Uh, there are many different metals which uh, can produce plasmons in UV range, and there's a lot of, of them given here. So gold and copper is around visible range. Anything in gray here is UV, and in particular this one is interesting here. So, and this number here, it represents um, this quality factor, how much enhancement of electric field you get by using particular metal. It's called a Faraday number in this case, but it's to do with the dumping, basically. Yeah, so and this is represented in the wavelength scale again. So um, gold has a very good plasmon, it's around 500 or so. But silver, aluminium, platinum, and so on, so can have plasmons in the blue region. So we work with aluminium, so, and it's good because if you want to detect things like water contaminations, uh, and if you want to have a water-based uh, water contamination, fluorescence-based sensor, you want to detect fluorescence from the water itself without labeling it much because it delays everything and doesn't allow to build a monitor uh, which does in streamline monitoring. So you need still to send things to laboratory, process it and so on. So, and there's different bands of contaminations in water labeled T, M and C. Um, and this is excitation for these bands. So a lot of excitation for these bands will lie in ultraviolet region and also fluorescence from these bands uh, associated with some microbial content or total organic content, particularly tryptophan molecules and things like this, are in UV. So the gold will not work here. So um, what you can do, you can build UV plasmonics, you can make particles of different shape, you can shape them around uh, of different metals. Here's the example of um, silver nanoparticles. Uh, sp space it by different gaps here, so you can see uh, when the gap is decreasing, the enhancement is increasing manifold here, so this is strength of the electric field, and this is the gap between particles here. So, and this is how 
actually a lot of interest here is, is not just having individual nanoparticles, but having them close uh, within each other. So, um, unfortunately here I, I lost the slide, so uh, I had a, a computer problem, so I had to draw something quickly for you. So we are not only using particles, but we're using particles which are spaced in regular intervals. Um, if you know anything about radio frequency or phased arrays, um, does it tell you anything? Probably not. So you can have individual antennas, which will emit light somewhere. So, but if you combine these antennas together, they will all work together. And instead of shining light here, there and there, somewhere far away from the antenna, you will see a beam. And it's good, you can have a beam in one direction, and you can rearrange antennas like this. But with the electromagnetics, you can actually play with these antennas and move this beam around. And this is what is done in phase arrays antennas in radio frequency. And you can do the same thing with light. If you can beam, ante beam antennas for light, you can do this. You can take the light, and instead of being reflected in this way from a mirror, light falling on it actually can go this way back. Or you can send one frequency going this way, and another frequency going that way, depending on spacing between these arena, arena, uh, arrays. So um, roughly this is shown in this slide here. So you can build very smart sensors, allow you to do the uh, spectroscopy, for instance, without any spectrometers. Another thing is application of plasmonics in DNA labeling. So you can label DNA and tell you where it is. It's similar to tagging, so you're a lot familiar maybe with this. So there's not that much fancy about it. This is sort of applications of tagging some cancerous cell. So you can uh, actually tag it in very particular space uh, so, and then image it on a different scale. So what is, um, you can do interesting here as well, is called photoacoustic imaging. When I told you, remember, you shine the light on the matter particle, it will transform the light, but light might get absorbed. This absorption of light will create a heat. Now, if you don't have a steady light, instead you have pulse of light. You will create a heat pulse and then cooling down. Heat pulse and cooling down. You can make this nanoparticle beep. And this beep creates an acoustic wave at the frequency of that laser. And you can actually image uh, things using these acoustic waves. You can build an uh, uh, acoustic sensitive sensor and detect acoustic waves from a particular part of the cell. So um, this is the example of the cell functionalized with gold nanoparticles. You can see you can make them stick in a particular way. Uh, so there's a type of cell. I have no idea what this cell means, but believe me, it's some sort of a cell functionalized with nanoparticles. So this is just nanoparticles on its own. Uh, and the cell on its own, there's nothing. So when you mix them together, you can detect acoustic signal in the nanoparticles uh, inside the cells. And you can do imaging, but also you can image inside the depth of the things. Um, another funny way is to do the imaging is, you know, the electronic microscopes. You have a beam of electrons which propagates in a vacuum. It can image you something. It's very difficult to do this with the uh, living matter because it doesn't like vacuum. and The beam of electrons is actually still quite big. Um, you can actually make nano SEM by using plasmonic frequencies. So you can make a very sharp, sharp tip of metal. You build some sort of an antenna here, which uses plasmonic coupling from light. Uh, so the light arrives on this tip, gets coupled here in this antenna, travels here, and what's happened here is actually instead of being light here, electrons can actually fly away from the tip because of the high electric field density and create an electron beam. So you can actually have a very nanoscopic electron beam which is, can be turned on and off by the light shining on that tip. So in this example of electron microscope imaging on a nanoscale using very sharp tip here. So. So this is a, a bit more about this application here. So you can see the electric field plotted here. And this is 20 nanometers. So you can see it condensed into some ridiculous amount of space. You will never get that with light. So, um, okay, for the catalysis, I will skip that. This is another interesting thing. Also, you can make um, reactions. You might be all seeing these nanorobots when they emit um, hydrogen 
uh, bubbles and travel through the liquid. But how do these me nano bubbles uh, make uh, they emit? You can actually use nanoparticles, which then couple the light, and you can attach. Uh, if you put this nanoparticle functionalized with platinum in, the, uh, for instance, peroxide, it will emit hydrogen here because of the catalysis. So, and you can make this bubble move around by shining light on them and activating this reaction. Yeah. Um, you can make very fancy chips. I will stop on it. Um, one thing I want to say, a part of this, there's alternatives to metal. So you don't need to use metal. There's another interesting thing is plasmonics based on carbon nanodots. You can make carbon nanodots. You can make them in different colors uh, by making different shells. Um, they can also be very small. Um, and they can fluoresce at different parts. So this is an example of carbon nanodot uh, imaging inside the mice. So you can functionalize certain cells and look at, I think it's a cell starvation here, somehow monitor it using carbon nanodots. Uh, this is teranostics. This is a use of metal nanoparticles to obliterate the cells you don't like. For instance, cancer cells here. So if you make them stick to the surface or even penetrate cancer cells and then turn the beam of laser, the nanoparticle heats up and destroy the cancer cell. Hooray, we won. Or you can make a drug release, for instance, if you can make membrane and you can stick nanoparticles to a, sort of a, underneath that membrane, so there's a drug here. It's good to deliver a drug to a certain point by touching the nanoparticle, but how do you make it detach in this place? Yeah. So you can use chemical reactions, but again, you can use plasmonic by shining light here, it will break this uh, drug coating from a nanoparticle and it will then deliver the drug in this particular location at this particular time. Generally, this is about it. Uh, uh, thank you very much. So if you have any questions, you're free to ask me now. But I say I will provide all this information for you in that folder so you can just pick up an article and read about when you read about more and see if you uh, can use this for some of your problems you have or might devise something very interesting to you yourself. Okay, thank you very much. Professor Nimura was getting very uh, anxious there, so I'll ask him to come and give you another talk. Uh, and hopefully you don't feel that tired. I'm really, really sympathizing with you sitting here at 7 o'clock in the night at the whole day. I haven't designed the problem like this. I'm really sorry. So I think they try to impress you with that many information, but I think it might have some downside as well. <laughs>